Well, how are we doing, church? It's good to be with you today, whether you're at home, whether you're gathering on a Sunday, whether you're gathering at a house church, or you're watching this during your lunch break, in your car, whatever it is. Greetings to you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I pray that God is so real to you, and I pray that God's hand would always be upon you. Um, we are now in week six of our study of the book of John, and I pray that it's been fruitful for you. I pray that, that you're learning a lot, um, not necessarily about uh, information, but, that, but I pray that you would receive the revelation of God that would make him that much more real to you. You know, the purpose of John's gospel was that so we would believe that Jesus was the Christ and in him find life and, and the kind of life that only Jesus offers. You know, you can work, get a better job during this time apart from God and you can find life, some life. I don't know about you, but I want God's life. I want all that Jesus came to offer all of us. And that's my prayer for you, that you would, you would, grow in your belief, that your faith would increase in, in, in God, that you would trust him uh, and have this complete dependency on him and, and his Holy Spirit that is here with us, that is here right now as we're talking, as we're communing uh, with one another. So as we continue, like I said, this is week six now, do me a favor, go ahead and grab your Bible. Um, if you're at home, I pray that you have your your handy Bible, your, 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 your physical Bible with you. But go with me to John chapter 2. We're going to continue in John chapter 2. And so we're going to start in verse number 13. So John 2 verse 13. If you're there, say I'm there. If you were first there, then your prize is in heaven. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe if you're at a house church, you can ask them for a piece of candy or you can have the last donut. How about that? If, if there's donuts at your house church, you get the last one. Um, if you're a diabetic, skip the donut <laughs> in Jesus name. Anyways, just joking. Anyways, uh, John 2 verse 13. Here's what the Bible says. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. If you have your own Bible, underline that. Zeal for your house will consume me. Verse 18, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered, turn to ever say remembered, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Somebody say, Amen to the word of God. So something that, that we're just going to get right into the text, okay? So first thing that we see here is the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Now, if you understand anything about the Passover, it was a feast where Jews would all come over from around the world. They would come to Jerusalem to celebrate what God had done in the Exodus. They would, this would be a moment of remembrance for them. And one of the things that was part of their custom in celebrating Passover was to clean out leaven from the household. Leaven is the yeast that through fermentation, it makes dough rise. And the reason it was forbidden is because it commemorated the haste by which God called them to leave their place of bondage and captivity, the place of their slavery. Leaven in Exodus was forbidden 
not just in foods, but also in homes. It's interesting that during this Passover season, that Jesus enters into the temple and he sees what you and I can perceive as leaven, something that did not belong in there. It was bad leaven. It was corruptible leaven. Some could say that it's evil leaven. Jesus would say this to, uh, to his disciples. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the corruptibility of the Pharisees. Beware of the hidden agendas of the, the Pharisees. It may be perceived and it may look like it's religious worship. It may look like it's for God. But the truth and the heart of the matter is that deep down inside that leaven would then... Um, it would, it would give rise to something that is actually not of God, that is actually for self instead of for God. Paul would say this. He would say a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, a little bit of something that is not supposed to be there, of something that can corrupt you, can change the makeup of what things should be in the eyes of God. Let me say it like this. You and I ought to be careful of what we allow in our space of worship. It can corrupt and misguide worship of God. Most of the time, what you allow in your space of worship will affect the zeal that you have for God and his house. And I'll elaborate more on that zeal that's found in verse 17. But rather than being consumed with zeal for God's house, you'll end up being consumed with zeal for the wrong house or you will find yourself worshiping the wrong thing. You have to be careful of this type of leaven. And here in this passage, I can see two types of leaven that that, um, uh, at least the Holy Spirit is wanting me to communicate to you and I as a neighborhood church. And so two types of leaven, and you can write these things down. First leaven is the leaven of greed. It's the leaven of greed. Listen, what Jesus saw that day in the temple, it was not an isolated instance of questionable worship support. In fact, what you read here is there's one instance of this in the beginning. Scholars say that what you read in the Synoptic Gospels is something that he also did towards the end of his ministry. Here we see it in the beginning. But the truth of the matter is, and what you see here, it was the outworking of greed cloaked with religion. Jesus would say this, this people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me. We see that scripture personified here. And something to realize here is that money serves us. We don't serve it, let alone worship it. And I think worship of money is subtle. It's sneaky. If it can affect you in such a way that it deters you from honoring God and di- and obeying God. If it causes you to disobey God, then 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 you're not worshiping. Then your zeal. Let me say it like this: Your zeal is misplaced. I finally found the words. Praise God. And here's why. And here's how it can work: Is rather than taking the word of God at face value when it comes to tithe, when it comes to offering. <laughs> If you're worshiping money, you'll try to find a workaround. You'll try, your mind will sit there and try to justify a certain way. And deep down inside, it will eat at you. Even though face in front of people, you will say, no, 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 I'm okay. No, these things, when you disobey God and you deliberately go against what he has said, when you try to make excuses for why you're not doing what he said, it will eat away at you. And we try to make these unbiblical excuses um, or maybe these excuses that are biblical, but they're out of context completely. We make these excuses up for why we don't give, why we don't tithe. And, and, and rather than poking at you and, and, and giving you the sense of condemnation, I want you to be free of that yoke of greed. And how do I do that? You got to clean it out. How do, how do I clean it out? You have to start obeying God. This is one aspect that God has said, test me in this. And you will never know the truth and the breadth and and, and the 
extravagance of what can provide, uh, what God can provide, if you keep trying to do things on your own, if you're trying to 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 uh, turn God's hand in a specific way so that it comes your way, God won't do that. What will happen is your zeal, instead of it being focused on God, it will be focused on greed and, and a subtle greed. It will be it will be set to what you feel like your heart desires rather than what God would want for your heart to desire. In this context, Jesus is saying here, my father is not being worshipped. Money is being worshipped in my father's house. And, and while you can get caught up in the emotion here, I don't want you to get caught up in the emotion of what Jesus was going through. Oh, Jesus got angry. Jesus got so mad. He threw over tables. He threw over a chain, uh, the, the money changers at coins. And he, he made a whip and he, he whipped all the, the, the animals to, to cause them to leave the temple. Who knows? Maybe he whipped some people too along the way. But it wasn't the demonstration of his emotion that you and I should be focused on. We should perceive it as a source of his zeal. Jesus came into the world to display the infinite worth of his father and to vindicate his father's honor. He wanted to free us from the killing effects of the love of money. It was greed that set Judas against Jesus, even though he knew who Jesus was. It was the effect of Judas's love for money that he took 30 pieces of silver instead of choosing to walk with and become be be content with walking and being with the messiah that was the leaven of greed the second leaven is the leaven of apathy and it's something to consider especially if you look at the verses before this with regards to the wedding that jesus and his disciples were invited to one of the things that you need to notice in that passage and it's the glaring issue is that the wine ran out Wine in the Bible is a symbol of joy. Joy was in essence lacking in this marriage celebration. And guess who was there? Guess who had been invited to restore the presence of joy in the wedding? And of course, that's Jesus. In the same sense, we see here in this passage at the temple during Passover, where everybody was pilgriming, coming towards uh, Jerusalem to celebrate this Passover feast, that the glory had departed from the temple. Just like the, the marriage ceremony ran out of wine, here we see a picture of the glory of God departing from the temple. If, if you remember your Old Testament, there's a moment where the Ark of the Covenant gets captured and, and a servant comes to Eli and tells him, hey, you know, they captured the Ark. And, and in that sense, in, the, in that moment, Eli falls over and he hits his head on something and then he dies. And then the sons of Eli, his, their wives had children. And one of the children's name was Ichabod, which meant the glory had departed. And so if you look at that, you can almost kind of superimpose that on here because in this sense, the true glory of the presence of God was not in the temple anymore. So instead of a house full of God's presence, it became a house of trade. People took advantage of other people's needs to have these elements for sacrifice. And so they tried to make it convenient for them to have sheep available, to have oxen available, to have pigeons available there so they can purchase what they needed in order for them to sacrifice. But here's the sneaky thing. It was in the form of that convenience that they were supposedly providing that apathy crept into their worship because they became more enamored with the convenience and, and, and they kind of succumbed to things being convenient for them and they lost zeal for the adoration of God. You know, there's something to be said about um, things not necessarily coming easy to you. 
and and think of it in this these days you know they had to pick out a sheep they had to pick out some oxen or pigeons whatever it was that they could afford in order for to for them to sacrifice people that were pilgriming uh from there they they would go look for these things because they couldn't bring all this stuff with them if if just some people just couldn't and so yes i get the the need for these elements for sacrifice but why did it have to be in the outer court in the temple for worship people took advantage of people's needs and by providing these things for them and what did it do it distracted them from true worship for god they were so zeroed in on buy this donkey buy this or not donkey <laughs> wrong story but buy this uh, oxen buy this sheep buy this pigeon and 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 what it happened was it distracted and it caused them to focus more on the elements instead of God. Now, while I'm all for removing any hindrances so people could worship God freely, the temple during this time period had become a, a bazaar or a swap meet of some sorts. And people were out there to try to make a profit, to try and make a profit in the name of God. And whenever a man misuses what God had intended for good, listen to me, you will not see his glory on it or in it until it's focused on him once again. And when the lack of experiencing God's glory becomes something that you get used to, then in that moment, in that sense, you, my friend, have lost your zeal. We have to make sure that we pursue God and not convenience. Because when we can pursue convenience, apathy will creep into your heart and you will become apathetic about your worship for God. We have to make sure that we are consumed with zeal for God and all that he gives. Just because something seems easy, just because something uh, appears comfortable and it seems so convenient, it doesn't mean it's godly. Just because the door is open doesn't mean that you pursue it. Listen to me, married man. Just because some chick is, is, is eyeballing you and winking at you and just because it appears so comfortable and so easy, that doesn't mean it's godly. Don't mistake what's easy, what's convenient, what's comfortable as something godly. Will God open all these doors for me? How do you know that the enemy didn't open that door? How do you know that just because it comes so easy that it wasn't a moment of temptation for you by the enemy to cause you to do something that is contrary to God? These money changers and all these people that were selling animals, it, while it seemed convenient, they became a distraction for God. I think a leaven of apathy has crept into our church. Not specifically, not just neighborhood, but in the big C church in general. For the past 25 30 years, we have become enamored with the place of our gathering instead of the one that we're supposed to be gathering around. We looked for what was the coolest looking church, who had the most people in the church, who, who had the best band in the church, and we lost sight of who we were supposed to be worshiping, the one that we're supposed to be gathered around. In essence, our zeal for God was not purely focused on God. Once 2020 took away all these things and God is all that we had, it's sad to me how many people became lost, how many people's faith were out of sorts, all because we lost sight of what, of who God was and we were so focused and enamored on being able to gather in a building. You have to remember, friend, that he is building us. He's not building a lukewarm crowd. He's building us. And the process by which he builds you and I is called discipleship. You and I are washed by the water of the word. And, and you have to make sure that you're positioned so that you can be watered by God. Some, most of us do that on our own. But, but I've seen God function and disciple people within social contexts, within uh, these, these gatherings of, of relationships. And most of the time, in fact, 99% of the time, the strength of that happens outside of the context of what we knew as Sunday gathering in a building. He is building his house 
brick by brick, he is building us to become a spiritual house. No building can contain what God is, is building in here. And I think the strength of a church is not measured by its attendance. It's measured by the presence of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of those who would call themselves disciples of Jesus. Those who would walk so boldly for him uh, in this dark and challenging season. And if that's you, tell, tell somebody. Go elbow somebody. Say, that's me. That's me. He's building me. I am on fire and I have zeal and I'm consumed by God and God alone because he is building me into his church. Somebody say amen if you believe that. You know, I believe this Holy Spirit has shifted us into gathering in, in smaller um, gatherings and house churches more specifically because the Word of God needs to be prevalent in our homes. So do this so that the leaven of apathy won't um, fall upon you. Make sure that when you go to house church, especially if it's in your house, get up, man. Get ready. Learn to grow in your faith and approach God in that sense. Get dressed. Don't stay in your pajamas with a cup of coffee and chill and watch, you know, me preach to you while you're in bed. Get up. Get up. Gather your kids around. And, and, and hey, children, we're going to learn about God today. We're going to press into the scriptures today. Grab your Bible and, and, and let's engage today. Engage and ask questions about what you just watched. Converse with your family about the things of God. You know, the Bible says, that you shall teach these things diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. This is what it says in Deuteronomy. So I think we need to press into these things so that we can we can clean out supposedly this, this leaven of apathy, this distracted worship that we've gotten used to and grown accustomed to. I don't know about you, but I want all of us to be on fire for God. I want you to feel the same passion that I have, uh, not just uh, for God, but also for God's people. And that, my friend, I want us to find that out of the context of the building. Building, temple worship, that'll all be there still. We're going to do that periodically and more frequently than you think. But at the same time, take it home. Give it to your children. Stop waiting for the children's pastor to teach your children. Teach your children. Demonstrate what it means to be a godly man, a godly father, raising children, raising godly children in their own home. Demonstrate what it means to be a godly mother who would do everything that she could to present herself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, so that the children can see it and they will worship the God that they are worshiping. Man, Imagine if we as believers took ownership of that instead of the whole apathetic attitude of when are we going to get in the building again? When are we going to gather in the church again? When are we going to do that? Man, if you can't worship God outside of the building, then I question where your zeal is at. Your zeal should not be focused on what this is around us in the building, but who is in you. Somebody say amen because I'm preaching here by myself to this camera. So the glory had departed from the temple. And Jesus was there in that specific instance to show what he was born to do. And that was to create a better temple for you and I. This, what I just gave you, was eleven that was present in the temple in that those days, the temple that Jesus entered into. So what does Jesus do when he sees this? The Bible shows us that Jesus began to clean out the temple of what did not belong in it. Jesus in that moment was saying, this is my father's house. How dare you profane my father's house with your leaven of greed and with your leaven of apathy. And he began to clean it out. He cleaned it out with zeal. This is the zeal John is talking about in verse 17. John is quoting Psalm 69 as he's describing what Jesus did to the money changers and the traders in this passage. And seeing Jesus do what he did, it reminded John of that the Messiah's zeal would be for the Father's house and that, that zeal would consume him. Zeal in the Greek is defined as eagerness. It's defined as enthusiasm. It has a connotation of jealousy and, 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 and that nothing could rival. There's, there's a rivalry established. This is, this is what it means to have zeal for my father's house. This is what it means to worship in my father's house. And this is what's not. 
and what's not is beginning to rival and it's beginning to take precedence. That leaven is creeping up and I'm not going to stand for it. That's the kind of zeal that Jesus demonstrated. It was zeal that he had for his father's house. And that zeal consumed him. He was consumed about making what is known as God's dwelling place a place of true worship, not a place for trade. Uh, something that I need you to understand here is that as we go on, I'm just going to move forward here because the Bible shows him cleaning things out, purging things out. And then you have this sect of Pharisees and, and they asked for a sign. By what sign do you do this? Like, we don't understand. But here, Jesus is demonstrating, and I really need you to get this, write this down. Jesus is demonstrating that he is replacing this old tradition, this old temple with a new temple. Remember what it says in John chapter 1, that um, he was the epitome of God's glory. John 1, 14 is that he chose to be with us. He tabernacled with us. You know, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory of the only son of the father. And so, and then he says that um, grace upon grace came. A better translation of that would be grace in place of grace. And then he says, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth was realized in Jesus. In other words, Jesus replaced the old grace of this temple and was replacing it with the temple of himself. Jesus became the new temple. He was, ex he was replacing the existing brick and mortar temple with uh, a fully living temple that was him. He broke down the traditions of the old leaven that produced greed and apathy in worship, and he restored it with the glory of the Father's house. And he restored the glory of the Father's house by, hi be by himself becoming the temple. So what does that mean? W what does that mean for me personally? One thing that you can take away from this is that the pilgrimage doesn't have to happen in Jerusalem anymore that you don't have to go to a specific place to honor and worship God. The mediator, it used to be the, the high priest. There used to be a high priest that would take these sacrifices and, and sacrifice on your behalf. Well, Jesus has now become the temple, which means that he is your high priest, and now that he is your mediator. The Bible describes him as your advocate for the Father. You go to Jesus who makes his appeal to the Father on your behalf. You don't have to go to a building. You don't have to purchase sheep. You don't have to purchase oxen, pigeons. You don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. You simply have to present yourself to Jesus. And that what, what does that mean? It means that God can be with you wherever you are. And so if I don't have to go to a specific place to worship anymore, what does that mean for me? It means that your temple worship is now in you. You know, if you would go and look back, 2 Samuel chapter 7 is one of the greatest passages in the Old Testament that, that to me demonstrate the house that God was building. Because if, just to paraphrase it, you know, David wanted to build God a permanent dwelling place, a temple. And so while God was enamored by that thought, he then flipped it and said, no, no, I'm going to make you into a house. That was realized when Jesus ascended, as Jesus said, you know, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. I will, I will, I will restore it again. And he was talking about the temple of his body. That temple is now what's inside of you. The Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. So where does the temple reside now? It is in you. Paul would say, don't you know that you are the temple of God, that you are the dwelling place of God. And if God is dwelling inside of you, then now it gives, it gives so much weight to the promise when he says, behold, I am with you, even to the end of age. It means that while you are here on this planet, with your finite years of life, he is with you. And after that, when you enter into the Zoe life of eternity, into his life that is, that is, that is never ending, that means that the God of, that, that created the heavens and the earth 
is still going to be with you. The God who would bear the sins of mankind, who would be crucified, who died, who is now alive, is going to be with you. And so he will be with you. He is with you. And he will always be with you is what I'm trying to communicate here. Somebody say amen before I get twisted up in my own words. <laughs> Christ is in you. The hope of glory. You, my friend, are the temple. You are the dwelling place of God. And that is what happens, that's what, what has happened when now that God has replaced the temple with Jesus. He's replaced the brick and mortar temple with a living temple, which is him, and it is now in you. It's now in me. The convenience that those Hebrews pursued in this passage cannot be corrupted anymore because the knowledge of his presence in you and that knowledge of his presence in you, that, my friend, ought to produce, produce some kind of zeal. You have to, that should produce zeal. If it's not pr producing zeal, then you need to check the reason why. And if, if, if it, let me put it this way. How do I get my zeal back, Pastor? If I lost my zeal, how do I get it back? Let me give you some things to write down here, okay? Number one, clean out the old leaven. Make sure that your worship isn't a lot of you and a little bit of God. Don't worship yourself. Worship God. If it's not of him and it doesn't belong in you, you need to clean it out. You need to sweep it out. You need to get that leaven of whatever it is. If it's greed, it's apathy. If it's unbecoming of who Jesus was and what we read about in scripture, get it out of you. You have to have some pep in you about that. You need to be on fire about that. I don't want this anymore. It's not of God. Take it away. And once you do that, you're going to see his supernatural hand move on your behalf. He will strengthen you and he will give you boldness and confidence to keep going in the direction that you're going. Because what you've done now is you've made a, a dwelling place for him inside of you that he desires to occupy. You are meant to be holy, set apart. And if you are cleaning things out, you can welcome his holiness. You can welcome his process of sanctification. And when you can embrace these things, God will meet you right there and you will find your zeal again. Praise God. Another uh, way that you can do this is you need to reestablish the, this temple. You need to reestablish the temple that's inside of you as a house of worship. The temple was the place where the people of God remembered all that God did for them and praised him for it. They would read the scriptures out loud. They would read the Torah out loud in the temple and they, were on, they would honor God for it. The temple was also a place of prayer. They would pray prayers of gratitude. Um, they would pray prayers of petition. They would ask God to intercede on their behalf. And you need to reestablish re -establish this house as his house. You need to make sure that, that this temple is honoring God. And this temple is in diligent pursuit of God. This temple needs to have some, some scripture reading happening in it so that the word of God may be consumed and implanted in your heart and you will not sin against the Lord. That you will be transformed by these things. That, that, whatever's, that whatever scripture it is that you read, God will use it to wash you by the water of his word. And you will become spotless and blameless in this generation. Somebody say amen to that. And lastly, I'm getting fired up in here, man. I hope you are too. And lastly, you can restore your zeal by gathering. Gather with other believers. Choose to be with other believers. I don't care if it's a cup of coffee. You guys go out to dinner once a week. Just be with people. You know, you, you'll see. I believe what a, a lot of what the disciples saw. They literally just followed and they watched Jesus most of the time. And, and while Jesus was here, they gave, Jesus gave them opportunities to be able to do something. But for the most part, they put themselves in a position, Jesus put them in a position to watch how he did things. You will gain so much when you can endeavor to watch what other believers, people that are more spiritually mature than you, those people that, that you, you, you are um, inspired by, those people that, that you look at their lives and go, man, 
I want to have a relationship with God like they have a relationship with God. Well, then watch them. Watch how they move. Watch how they tick. Watch how they love their spouse. Watch how they parent their children. Watch how honorable they are with, with, with their employment. Watch how they, they worship God with their finances. Watch what they do. In your watching, in your gathering around these people, you will find yourself blessed. And likewise, you, my friend, have the opportunity to be a blessing to others. So gather in your neighbor's house. Demonstrate the zeal that you have for his house by loving on your neighbor. The Bible says where two or more are gathered, he is there in the midst. Somebody say amen to that. So as we close here, I just want to pray. And I want to pray more specifically for your zeal and what's consuming you. Because my heart and my prayer for you is to be consumed by God and the things of God. I, I think once you develop that kind of hunger, zeal is just a natural byproduct. So do me a favor, bow your heads right where you're at. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the example that Jesus left for us. That here, God, we get a glimpse of what he was excited about, what he was passionate about, God. The things that drove him, Lord the things that produced emotion out of Jesus. And it was a passion, Lord, to honor you. A passion, God, to just honor and worship you. I pray, Lord, that the people that are listening to my voice right now would hear this and they would be led, God, to pursue you that much more. That we would clean out, God, the things that do not belong in us. That we would honor you, Lord, with everything that we are. God, I pray that we would reestablish this temple, the one that's in our hearts, where you are seated, God, where you are dwelling, God. This temple, Lord, that, that, that Paul spoke about, God, that, that we are the dwelling place of God. I pray, God, that this would be a house of prayer, that this would be a house of worship, that, that we would present ourselves, Lord, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, God that our worship would not just be singing, but a demonstration of our lives, God, lived out to honor you. I pray, God, for community, Lord. I declare, God, for community to spring forth all over the valley, God, all over wherever your church is at, God. Authentic, pure, God, everyday community. Not just a Sunday gathering, Lord, but people, God, of whom profess to be your followers, Lord that they would gather around you and honor you and worship you. We love you so much, God, and we're so thankful, God, for all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's so good to be with you today. I pray, God, that you're doing well. If you need anything, holler at us, um, email us, or message us on our website. God bless you. We'll see you next time.